But you're glad, we're glad that you're here to worship with us. We have translation available in Spanish and in Russian, uh, so you can make uh, those things available to you. But we're glad you're here uh, with us today. Well, recently I was watching one of those YouTube videos where someone is on the streets and they're just going around with a microphone uh, interviewing people. And the title of this video was something like, what is it like to be 80 years old? So this guy is walking up to older people on the street and asks them, what's it like to be 80, 80 plus, even 90? And some of them gave the answers that you might expect, right? The older you get, you know, the harder it is to move around, the more your joints ache and so on. Uh, they also said it's painful seeing a lot of their friends uh, die and pass away. But they also said that many times they feel invisible. Young people maybe don't know what to say to them or how to act around them, so they just ignore them. So the older people will walk on the streets and they say sometimes not only will people not even talk to them, a lot of times people won't even look at them. It's, it's like they're not even there. They said it's like they are invisible. You know, can you relate to that a bit? You don't have to be 80 years old to feel invisible. You don't have to be 80 years old to feel unseen, to feel unheard. Maybe that's you today. You feel invisible. You feel that no one cares about you or cares about your situation. Well, this morning I want to look at a story from the Bible that talks about that. Last week we looked at the story of Abraham and Isaac in Genesis 22, and we saw that Abraham passed God's test. Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac as God had asked him to do. But right before Abraham was going to do it, God said, stop, and provided a ram as a substitute. You know, and I said that last week, one of the reasons Abraham passed the test is because he had learned from previous tests that he had failed. And one of those failed tests involved a woman named Hagar. Who is Hagar, and what can we learn from her today? Well, that's what I want to look at. So if you have a Bible, please turn with me to Genesis Chapter 16, we'll have the text for you uh, as well on the, up on the screen. But Genesis, ch Genesis chapter 16, starting in verse 1. It says, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. So in verse 1, we have the let's say, the three characters in this triangle. As I said last week in Genesis 2, God made a covenant with Abram or Abraham. One of those promises was that God would make a, a great nation through him, which we know became the nation of Israel. But in order for that to happen, Abraham needed to have a child, right? But we read here that time has passed, and as it said in verse 1, they haven't had children. At this point, Abraham is 85 years old. They're getting older. The clock is ticking, let's say. And we see here that Sarah has a servant named Hagar. She's likely young in age. We know that she's a, a foreigner. It says she's from, from Egypt. And this is a bit ironic because here in Genesis 16, Genesis 16 it's the Egyptian who's the servant to the Israelite. Um, and later in the uh, uh, Old Testament, the Israelites will become slaves and servants to the Egyptians. So she's a foreigner, she's an outsider, but she serves Sarah. Look at verse 2. It says, And Sarah said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant, servant. it may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. So after Abraham lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. So Sarah decides to take control, to take matters 
into her own hands. She didn't believe that God would give her children, so she needed to do something, she thinks. She tells Abraham to sleep with, with Hagar so she could get a child through her, and we, ultimately Hagar becomes another wife of Abraham. Now, as readers, this is surprising to us, but this would happen back then in other cultures. The wife couldn't get pregnant, so the husband would sleep with one of the servants in order to have uh, a child. It might seem strange to us, but it would happen back then. It was legal, let's say. But we should say here that just because something is legal, just because something is accepted by the culture, that doesn't mean that it pleases the Lord. Remember in the Garden of Eden, God said, a man shall leave his father and mother and be you to be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. God said wife, not wives. God said two shall become one flesh, not three shall become one flesh. Just because something is legal, just because something is accepted by the culture, that doesn't mean it pleases our Lord. And while we're speaking about the Garden of Eden, verse 3 here in chapter 16 sounds a lot like Genesis 3 when sin came into the world. In Genesis 3, it said that Eve saw that the tree was good for, for food. She took the fruit and she gave it to Adam, her husband. Here in verse 3 in chapter 16, Sarah takes Hagar, gives her to her husband, Abraham. And in both chapters, Genesis 3 and Genesis 16, the man is passive. Abraham, or Adam was passive in the garden, and in chapter 16, Abraham is not doing much either. He listened to Sarah. He goes along with her plans. He doesn't resist. And it's about to get messy. But it didn't have to be this way, right? The problem was that Sarah became impatient. She didn't trust God's timing. My first point this morning, I didn't create this phrase, so you've probably heard it before, is God's delay is not God's denial. God's delay is not God's denial. Sarah told Abraham that God had prevented her from bearing children, but we know the rest of the story. We know that wasn't true. Eventually, she did give birth to Isaac. She did bear children. God was faithful to his word. But Sarah was impatient. She tried to run ahead of God, and that created a mess. Let me tell you this morning, God might not be saying no to your prayers. It's very possible he could be saying not now to your prayers. He might just be saying, wait and trust me. You know, I think we can all sympathize with Sarah. We've probably all been there. I know I, I have. Something wasn't happening, so I felt like I needed to do something. I needed to make it happen. And usually the results were always bad. I look back and I think, why didn't I wait on the Lord? Let me ask you this morning, what are you waiting for today? What is God calling you to trust him with this morning? How are you dealing with the waiting? Because the waiting is typically the hardest part. And it can be easy for us to jump to conclusions. It can be easy to think, well, I guess God is saying no. But as I said, maybe he's not saying no. He's just saying not now. God's delay is not God's denial. Wait on the Lord. Trust him. His timing is perfect. His timing is right on schedule. Bad things happen when we try to run ahead of God's perfect plan. As we see in verse 4. Look at verse 4. And Abram went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarah said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between me and you. But Abram said to Sarah, behold, your servant is in your power. 
do to her as you please. Then Sarah de dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. So in verse 4, we see they, they go through with Sarah's plan. Abraham sleeps with Hagar, and she gets pregnant. But when she gets pregnant, she also gets prideful. She starts to look down on Sarah. So we see Sarah's plan is starting to get spoiled. When, ha when Hagar looks at Sarah with contempt, Sarah gets upset. She loses it. And who did she get angry at? Abraham, her husband. Now the drama is coming in to their marriage. Now you might expect Abraham to say, why are you getting mad at me, Sarah? This is your plan. This was your idea. But again, Abraham is passive. We could even say that he is being passive aggressive. Look at what he says to, to Sarah in verse 6. He said, look, she is your servant, so you do whatever you're going to do with her. In other words, not my problem, right? What we see here in Genesis 16 and what we also see in Genesis 3 is the temptation for husbands to be passive, to not lead, to just sort of go with the flow and not stand up for what is right. So was Eve wrong for taking the fruit? Of course. Was Sarah wrong for trying to make a shortcut with God's plan? Absolutely. But both Adam and Abraham were wrong for being passive. Let me just say something to us men. You know, some of you are already husbands. Some of you will be husbands one day. Let me just challenge you to lead your families for the Lord. The Bible says that you are the head of the household, which means that God is going to hold you responsible for how you lead your family. Don't be passive. Don't be passive aggressive. Don't just blame everything on your wife. Be active. The Bible says love your wives as Christ loved the church. And ladies, if you're not married yet, look for godly men who are responsible, who love the Lord, who are active, not passive. Pray for a godly man that will treat you with respect and love. And ladies, if you are married, let me just ask you, are you helping your husband be the man of God that he desires him to be? If your husband is passive, is there any room in your marriage for him to act is there any space for him to do something? Are you building him up with your words, or are you tearing him down? The Bible says for the husbands to love their wives, but it also says for the wives to respect their husbands. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, yeah, 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 but my husband. <laughs> yeah, 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 but my wife. I don't know your situation. I don't know the dynamics of your marriage. Each relationship is unique. But God gave every husband the same command, and God gave every wife the same command. Make sure you are faithful with the command the Lord has given you. So back to the story. First, Sarah blames Abraham, and then she starts to go after Hagar. Verse 6 says that she dealt harshly with Hagar, and then Hagar runs away. Look at verse 7. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarah. So an angel of the Lord, it says, comes to, to Hagar. Some people think this is Jesus, let's say pre-incarnate. Others think this is a, a messenger acting as God's representative. Either way, this angel is speaking on behalf of the Lord. And he finds Hagar in the wilderness on the way to Shur. This little detail lets us know that she was running back to Egypt. She was running back to her home country. And we know that she's just running away because in verse 8 it says she is fleeing from Sarah. Hagar thinks she can solve her problem by running away 
from her problem. That leads me to my second point this morning, and that is running away from your problems does not solve your problems. Running away from your problems does not solve your problems. Now, I wouldn't want to be around Sarah either if I was Hagar. But running away, trying to escape isn't solving anything. It's just going to create more problems because she's already pregnant with Abraham's child. You know, when we're in trouble or when we have a crisis, escaping, running, it can seem like the best option. But it never is. Because wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> if you don't deal with the issue today, that issue is going to be there tomorrow. Running away from your problems is never the answer. This is what the angel of the Lord says to Hagar. Look at verse 9. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. Not only does the angel of the Lord tell her to stop running and to return, but he also reminds her that Sarah still has authority over her. She is still Sarah's servant, so she must return to her and presumably try to make it work. Instead of running from her problems, the angel of the Lord says, you need to deal with these head on. You know, this morning, if you're here today and you're running from something, maybe you're running from a certain responsibility, maybe you're running from certain people you need to deal with, or maybe you're running away from God, let me just say that you can run to the other side of the world, but if you don't deal with those things, they will keep finding you. And we can learn from Hagar. Stop running from your problems and go deal with them. It may be hard, but this honors the Lord, and it ultimately is healthy and what's best for you. I mean, if Hagar can go back to Sarah's home and deal with all that mess there, then you can deal with whatever issues you need to deal with. The saying is true. <laughs> wherever you go, there you are. But as believers, wherever you go, the Lord is with you too. And he can make a way when there seems to be no way. Look at verse 10. It says, The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, to her Behold, you are pregnant, shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So the angel of the Lord doesn't just tell Hagar to go back. He tells her to go back, and he adds a promise. She's not just going back as a young, foreign slave girl. The angel tells her that she will be blessed with numerous descendants. In other words, God is going to take care of Hagar. Her son shall be named Ishmael, which means God hears. And we see in verse 12, Ishmael won't be an easy child, let's say. People will be against him and his descendants and vice versa. And we know this is true from, from history. So the religion of Islam claims to have a right uh, to the promised land because they view Ishmael as one of their fathers in the faith. So since that time, there's been hostility, there's been unrest between the Jews and the Arabs, and it continues to this day. We see the prophecy comes through. But this is still before all of that happens. And first Haggai responds to the angel of the Lord. Look at verse 13. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well was called Bir Lahai Roi. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. He was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So Hagar gives the, the, name, uh, the Lord a name, which is an extremely rare thing in the scriptures. She calls him El Roi, which means that he is the God who sees. She names him this 
because she feels and knows that the Lord has looked after her. And that leads me to my next point this morning, and that is simply the Lord sees you, the Lord hears you, and the Lord watches over you. You know, when we read the book of Genesis, 